Welcome, everybody. Today we have a special guest, Mark Prensky. Mark is someone who has created terms such as digital native and div digital immigrant. Mark has written books, eight books. He's published hundreds of articles, done keynotes, speaking presentations everywhere, 40 countries, and I mean everywhere. You look at his resume and you'll see years where he did presentations almost every other day. Amazing work. So we're going to talk to him today. So welcome, Mark. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So before we get started, I do just want to say your terms, digital native and digital immigrant, we are going to get to them a little later, but I've got to say they've always resonated with something that I'm teaching because I, I grew up, I was born in 1979 and I always felt like there was this generational difference there, you know, right when you define the digital native versus digital immigrant. And it's always resonated so well with how I teach and have approached technology in general. So I want to say thank you for creating those terms because it's given me something to piggyback on in all my courses that I teach. So thank you for that. And we are going to get to talk about those. Um, but I want to start today with kind of how you got started. So you start out you are at Oberlin College as an undergrad, your French, math, science major. What was your, how did your college, that those four years as an undergrad, how did that shape you when you went, your next career was teaching? You went into teaching after that. How did that shape you? What were you like as a college student? I think we need to start before that. Okay, yeah, let's do that. And so the, the big influence on me was Sputnik. I was a, I was a Sputnik kid, part of that generation. The thing went up, everybody panicked. Sure. Not learning enough math and science. They all need to go that way. Anybody who's smart needs to study math and science. And so that's where I was pushed and that's where I went. And voluntarily, uh, at first, uh, I, I enjoyed it. I still enjoy math and science, thinking about those concepts. So, uh, so that was fine and that took me all through high school. And then uh, at the end of, of high school, I thought, oh, I definitely want to stay in science. So I applied to be a chemistry major and I got into, I went to Oberlin, uh, which I went to where my, because my best friend had gone to Oberlin, <laughs> uh, which in retrospect is kind of a silly way to choose a college, but, um, but I did. And I was, for my first three years at Oberlin, I was a chemistry major and I took all the required courses and I took a lot of math and I didn't particularly like it. And what I particularly hated were the labs. Yeah. And if you're going to be a chemist and you hate That's the what labs, you do. I think you're in trouble. Right. So, and I could never get them right. And it was, the, I had the same problems with labs that I had with cooking that, that, you know, I was supposed to do this earlier and add it to the mix and I didn't do that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble now. So, uh, so in my senior year, after starting my senior year of college, I remember one day riding my bike and saying to myself, you know, you don't have to do this. You have enough credits in French because you happen to like that and started that in high school to actually do that major because that major was a small credit requiring major. Gotcha. And so literally that day I did, I switched. <laughs> my, my chemistry professors were aghast and the French guys were hopefully happy. Um, but I did. And so I never regretted that. And one of the great life sort of um, aphorisms, I guess, that I took away from that and that I have used all my life is this. If there's something you don't like to do, for God's sakes, don't get good at it. <laughs> because as soon as you get good at something you don't like to do, whether it's consulting or medicine or anything, people are going to say, do it. Do it. You're good at it. And if you don't want to do that, well, then you have to really fight hard to do what you want to do. And more or less, that's the story of my life is, is essentially fighting hard to do what I wanted to do rather than what people expected me to do or, or suggest that I do. So where did uh, the teaching come in from the French? Well, the teaching came in really uh, regarding Vietnam. 
because the the only way not to go to Vietnam was to have a deferment, and the deferment that I got was a teaching deferment. Gotcha. First, it was a, a graduate school deferment, and then it was a teaching deferment. And since I was really vehemently opposed to the Vietnam War, uh, it was important that I not go. Uh, and you know, if you look at the movies like like Deer Hunter, you can see why. Sure. It was the 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 most life threatening in the long run experience that people had around that time. So, uh, so that, that explains the teaching and, and, uh, but it was a curious thing because when I finished, when I finished Oberlin and I was a French major, then I went to, uh, two years of graduate school, one at Yale and one in France. And somebody remarked when I came out, I had the same number of years in chemistry and in French. <laughs> I had done essentially six years of, of college, right? So, or, or, um, so I had three and three, which is fine because now I, I like science. I have a background in science. I know when something is scientifically uh, correct or not. And so much isn't these days. Sure. And so, but, but I also like humanities and I also like culture and I like many other things as well. Uh, and I try to combine them. And the way I, I've wound up combining them in my life is through kids, is essentially through kids. And, and I'm not interested particularly in, in quote, education. I'm not interested in particularly in, all, I'm interested in helping kids. And I'm interested in helping them find their way in ways like that we're talking about uh, to say as early as possible, what do I care about? What are the problems I want to fix? What are my strengths? What am I good at? And what do I love to do? And if, if the sooner somebody can put those together for at least temporarily, the easier it is for them to go in the directions that they want to go, that will be positive for them. Sure. So at this time in your life, you, you, went to, you went to Yale, you go to graduate school, you get your master's degree in teaching, you're a teacher, then you started working at um, another company as a, a director. This was uh, Citibank Street Academy. And then at, right after that, you went and became a musician for a number of years. You also did some other work in that time, but you were a musician, professional musician for like seven years or something like that. Well, I'd always wanted to be an actor and a musician. And so the, the, the teaching was just I had to do it because of the situation I just described. And, and I did, and I enjoyed the kids. Uh, I didn't enjoy a lot of the, the parts of teaching that were required. Uh, and so after I taught for a couple of years in a high school in East Harlem, uh, this a position opened up for uh, the director of a, what they called a street academy, which today we would call a charter school, yeah. essentially. And, and I took it and I got it. I took it and I went in and it was a, like a cultural immersion experience because nobody else in the place was white. And it was wonderful. I did it for, uh, I think, a year or two years, maybe. And I really loved it. But I'd always wanted to be an actor and a musician. And so as soon as I turned 24 which was the magic age for the military, I said, bye-bye, I'm leaving, I'm going to do that. And then it turned out that I was not a very good actor. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of us learned that. I kind of learned that myself as well. After seeing myself on a few TV commercials that I tried, I was like, no, I'm not good at this. <laughs> I'd been in lots of little things and taken this thing, but acting is a totally different story. Acting is really becoming somebody else than you are. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't do that very easily. I, maybe I could have learned more about doing it, but I didn't. But what I was more naturally gifted at was music. So that, was, that made that decision easier. And I started playing music. And I had been trained as a classical guitarist growing up. And I then switched to the lute where there was even less competition. And so I was able to do that and earn a modest living for several years. Uh, the problem was that that modest living, my sense was, would have continued at that level for the rest of my life. Yes. And that was unacceptable. Uh, so I said, what can I do to earn more money? At some point I read 
in, a, in an article, I think in New York Magazine, that people who went to business schools like Harvard or the top business schools were being paid at that time $60,000 salaries when they got out. And uh, you know, today it's double that or more. And so I said, oh, why not? I'll do that. Well, you know, that was a, that was a mixed blessing because of the thing that I said before, which is if there's something you don't like to do, for God's sakes, don't get good at it. So you go to Harvard and to get your MBA. So I wound up getting into Harvard Business School, uh, mostly because I really crammed like hell for the, for the graduate record exam, <laughs> whatever it was. I memorized all the vocabulary. I did this sure. and I had math background. So I scored really well on those tests. And it turned out that year, Harvard, for some reason, was looking for a creative class. So I got it. And then I discovered, woo these people are very different from me and their attitudes and business. Business never really took with me. It just didn't. But I met a lot of people and I had some very interesting experiences. And it got me, and I did well. So it got me into the Boston Consulting Group. And that experience, which was not especially pleasant while I was going through it, for lots of reasons, uh, really shaped a lot of my future life, I think. So the experience at Boston? The, the experience at the Boston Consulting yeah. Group, where I was for six years. And what that showed me that I had no idea about, I mean, I didn't even know there were consultants before I went to business school. I had sure. never even heard of the profession. So here I am in this consulting firm, a musician, right? <laughs> and we're trying to solve huge business problems, right? And, and do this, and how do I do this? Well, the answer turns out that you just have to look at this stuff with fresh eyes. You really have to look at the problems in a different way than the people who are inside the businesses have ever looked at them. Sure. And if you do that, you'll see things that they don't see. And some of those things could be really helpful. And, and so that's what I did or tried to do. And, it, and, and I learned in a sense to do it, which I, you know, I'd never even thought of before. Well, that's now what I do with education. That's now what I do with kids. I now say to myself, what if we imagined just having kids, no education tradition whatsoever, no schools, no anything. We have kids and we have the future we have, right? We have the future with the technologies and how fast they're coming and, and everything that, that uh, COVID and all the stuff together, you know, put it all together. And what should we do? What's the best system we could create for raising those kids? And, and I have thought about that a lot, and I have some thoughts on that. So that's, that's really what I do today is trying to spread those thoughts, which are very different than what most people say or think. So do you think your experience as a consultant really helped shape some of the skills that you're utilizing today to, you know, form these thoughts about how to change education and improve things? Was it like a performance improvement type skill that you really learned as a consultant? I don't think it was a some, I mean, I guess it could be described as a performance enhancing skill, but it was mostly a skill in reframing and looking at things differently. And it's, it's interesting because I once had a, not too long ago in Davos wound up having a conversation with Bibi Netanyahu, the head of Israel, who was also for a short time at the Boston Consulting Group. And, and we reminisced a little bit. And he said to me this very interesting, he said, you know, those few years I spent at the Boston Consulting Group had a huge influence on the state of Israel. And of course, I wrote that to all my colleagues and they were all happy, but it's true that when you see it's it's like any other change in perspective major change of perspective which is what um kuhn calls a a paradigm change paradigm shift a paradigm shift is not doing different things it's seeing things differently the same things so whenever you start to do that whenever you have a paradigm shift in your own mind you start doing different things and you start coming up with different 
ways of, of thinking about things. And that, to me, if, if to the extent that anybody thinks my, my performance has improved, you know, that's a matter of judgment, uh, that's a lot of where it came from. Interesting. Yeah, I, yeah, you know, I spent time as a management consultant, and it's it's just weird how that shaped me to to be able to go into new situations and just analyze as like this, you know, process improvement person or business architecture, whatever phrase you know people were using at the time to describe it. But uh, okay, so after Boston Consultant, you go and you work at uh, Micro Mentor. You you work as a at the VP level, so you're starting to apply to these more senior roles, and you go work at Bankers Trust. So you're doing these two things. You're in senior positions, but you start to get into, you know, computers and e-learning a bit. Is that correct? Well, I had a lot of time. I had a lot of trouble leaving the Boston Consulting Group. I had gotten into a very interesting position where I was literally creating new products for them, and. And it was time to move on. And I really had no interest in moving into the normal strat strategic um, direction positions that people from BCG and companies like that went into. Sure. So, you know, leader of strategy, whatever. I, and I almost took one, but I didn't. And so I had a lot of trouble figuring out what I would do. And I wound up going to this small company that was doing um, training for managers in using these newfangled things called personal computers that had just come to the world in the early 80s. And showing the senior managers who had no clue about anything, how they could use some of these tools to model their business. <laughs> I think about the stuff that is, you know, today trivial, uh, but, but at that time it was, it was really new. And so that's what this company did. And I looked around and said, Oh, you know, that's not all that interesting, uh, making spreadsheet models. And so, but we had these issues in terms of training that people were just not doing the things that we want, that the companies wanted them to do. And I, that was when I had first gotten into games and I had played some very interesting simulation games, like an early simulation of doing appendectomy. Oh, wow. Uh, you kept dying and you had to do everything right. And it was, it was pretty complex. And that was, that was, and I said, well, maybe we can do that for some of these other things. So I said, what, what if we made some games? And, and at that, just at that moment, the Mac came out. Mm -hmm. And suddenly computers could walk and talk. Yes, right? they could do all they kinds of cool they things. Could do, that they could do new <laughs> things that you couldn't do before. And we had HyperCard, which was mm -hmm. like an amazing program where you could create very interesting things. I remember using it, yep. So the very first game that I created was for an airline, for Scandinavian Airlines, and it was called Where in the World is Carmen San Diego's Luggage? Because... You as a as an agent had to you know give good customer service and find the luggage. Carmen San Diego was the most popular game at the time. Reached out to the company, got permission, and blah blah blah. And and so uh, and then we went on from there, making these really interesting uh, simulation games essentially. And they were uh, and they were successful. And we even did one in the long run for BCG. Uh, so. So that was a lot of fun, and that's where I really discovered computers. I had learned about them a little bit at, at, uh, at BCG when I was making tools for consultants, uh, and the and now I was I said these are these are great, these are great, and eventually in my life they replaced the guitar, they replaced music. I I played my whole life, and suddenly I realized no, the the computer is my instrument. Uh, it's very different, so. So that's really what happened, and, and I figured out these things, and then I went to Bankers Trust because they needed people to, they needed somebody to create better training for their, um, for their traders yeah. who, you know, who were kind of wild and out of compliance, and the SEC said, they sued them, and they said, you have to do better. Yeah. And so my, 
devs hired me and we created some really fun games for them. We created a game called Straight Shooter, where which is the first, very first first person shooter game for business, uh, where you had to shoot light bulbs out of your cell phone and capture these uh, clients running around and then answer the questions correctly and in order to in order to do that. And then we made another we made another game for another company called um, the Monkey Wrench Conspiracy, where it was this was for a company that did um, CAD CAM. They had a new a new CAD program that was very good in 3D. And we conceived of Dr. Monkey Wrench, who went around the universe breaking things, but then you had to go and use the, their CAD program to fix. So that was also very successful, and they made a million copies of that and distributed it. I don't think the company was that successful. I think they're still in business. But uh, they, we, and that was a lot of fun. And then I made a whole bunch of, of what somebody referred to as trivia games, little quiz games sure. that had lots of fun interfaces. Uh, and we spun off a company from Bankers Trust to sell that stuff. So how did you spin off that company from them? They just allowed you to do that or? It was, it was really interesting. Uh, at, in, after very close to 100 years, um, Bankers Trust essentially went out of business because it had been, it, even though it was very innovative, it had gotten so many lawsuits from the derivatives that it was trying oh, wow. to sell that they, they literally had to sell themselves and they wound up selling themselves to Deutsche Bank at the last moment. When they did that, they had to figure out what everybody could do. I mean, sure. most of the people left and my boss, who was a really nice supportive guy, said okay yeah you can take these assets and go run wow it. and so i did and i had that uh, and that gave us a number of years of fun uh, experience making a little company growing our little uh, called games for games to train and i enjoyed that we discovered that it was a whole lot more fun to work at home than to work in an office together even <laughs> And four of us or five of us in an office together got on each other's nerves. So, so we all became, we became virtual very, very quickly. And we went on for a number of years and that was, uh, that was good. And along that time is when observing the people working for me and how they addressed and solved problems, which was often instead of my calling the expert I knew, they would just post it online and they would always get a faster and better response. I came up with this idea of digital natives. And, and I wrote an article. First it was Twitch speed, then it was digital natives, digital immigrants. And it, it hit the right nerve at the right time. Just like you described. It, it caught up, it put words around something that somebody, that everybody in the world was experiencing in one way or another that they couldn't, didn't have a good way to talk about. They would just say, my kids are kind of different or they're so smart or they're, they're a million things. It didn't occur to people that they were just from another world. Sure. That their whole experiences were different. And so today, and you were said you were gonna ask about this, so I'll just launch right in. Go for it. And don't, I put out those terms. I wrote a piece called Digital Natives, Digital Immigrants. The story is a lot of fun because it was published in a very obscure journal online. And one day I get an email and it says, we are the Gifted Children's Association of New Zealand. We read your article in the newsletter of the Gilded, Gifted Children's Association of Tasmania. Can we republish? You know, who knew? <laughs> who knew? <laughs> But what I realized, and this is still totally important, is that in the absence of the physical connections and not being, you know, next door in the office next door or in the next sure. town, in the next country even, people search online. They look for the interesting things that are online. And they found me and they found this article and eventually others found it as well. But... Uh, but what it, the reach and the possibilities of connection are so different in this new world. And it occurred to me that it was a real new world. 
Yes. So I started writing about it and thinking about all the ways in which it was a new world. And today, and then I, there was lots of flack about that came my way, especially from England, for original natives. Is it a myth? Is it a thing? And, and then people objected to the word natives, and other people objected to the word immigrants. And, <laughs> so you can't you know, win. That's the world. Um, I don't know if anybody objected to the word digital, but probably. <laughs> Um, today I talk about more or less the same thing in different terms. Today I talk about the last pre-internet generation, mm -hmm. which was everybody born before 1900. Every adult who is over the age of 20 was born in the 20th century. And, and versus the first internet generation of many to come. Yeah. And, and I talk, what I'm really focused on now is beliefs. And uh, that's the, the, the big difference between the generations has nothing to do or little to do. It has something but it has little to do with the technology. It has everything to do with what they believe. So people in the last pre-internet generation in general, there are exceptions, believed that kids were not powerful because we weren't. We didn't have many tools. We couldn't do many things. And so we had to stay in school for all these years. They believed that kids couldn't accomplish big things in the world because we couldn't. Sure. And so that they, but they, and so there are a lot of these beliefs that have been brought forward into the 21st century that really don't reflect the realities of the 21st century. No, because things are way different now. Kids are, I mean, take YouTube and Twitch. Kids have more views and followers than pretty much any adult out there. That's right. And they have access to every single book in the world's library. Yes. They have access to all the world's knowledge. Doesn't mean that they all look at it every day, but it, it's so different than when that stuff was limited and you had to go to a library and you had to go to college and you had to learn from a teacher how to connect ideas and you had to do a lot of things that really are done almost automatically today. And yes. even yes. not almost. But uh, I don't know if you know, if you're familiar with IBM Project Debater, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but that uh, a machine, Watson, can hold a conversational formal debate with another person and hold its own. And you know, I, I, I think they came close to winning in the first one and they may um, have done better since. Yeah. So, so many things are shifting from human capabilities to machine capabilities, and and those are are uh, that that really frightens a lot of people from the last pre-internet generation, who thought these were humans were so special because they could read or write or 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 do many things that machines just do now. We we all our sports writing is done by machines, yeah. right? And you don't need a person to say this this person trounced that person, and you can even have a list of verbs. Right, that are the the sports room. So, and what's happening is that more and more sophisticated things are becoming machine things, like debating, uh, like critical thinking, like you know a bunch of consulting that we used to do. Where we had to do uh, ways of thinking are becoming um, with AI, especially machine oriented. Yeah, I mean so, AI is doing so much of that now. It's it's so cool. Yeah. So then you got to think about, and I, you know, I have a nice slide because I've been thinking about this, as to what, you know, where we are headed with all of this kind of stuff. And so there are things that machines don't do well and are probably not going to do well for a long time. One of them is loving. That's, you know, another one is dreaming and imagining. And they, they might have the primitive uh, you know, ways in this direction, but... Those kind of things, and particularly getting things done, setting a goal and accomplishing, that those are not machine things. Those are people things. And so what I see is happening now is that we're becoming symbiotic hybrids with our machines. And that's really, really important because if you see the machines in the 20th century way as tools, oh, yeah, people have always used tools, but people are people and they're special then you behave in one way and you're you're prone to like take the tools away from the kids when you see them using too much of them 
when you see it as a symbiosis, you see it as, oh, these kids have a new limb. They have a new hand that can help them in many, many ways, not all of which we have figured out yet. Sure. But if you take away their, their mobile phone, you're cutting off their hand. And that can't be positive. <laughs> no, and I think we're really seeing that with coronavirus right now, how important this technology has shaped us moving forward in life. I mean, imagine if this would have happened in 1985. Yeah. Well, it did happen in, 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 in 1900, right? Or sure. So, so the, or 1920, whatever it is. So, yeah, you cope with whatever it is. But it's certainly, uh, you know, uh, an accelerant and a marker between the, pre the previous century and, the, and the, f the future century so that all the schools are rushing to get online. But there's a danger in that as well that, that is, people are not paying enough attention to, I think, especially educators. Most of what's being done, most of what, quote, ed tech is all about is doing the things that we used to do in the 20th century in new ways. So my kid sits in front of the computer getting lectures and he fills out worksheets on the computer and all that stuff does nothing. In fact, it's a step backwards because you don't have the in-person uh, parts of it to, to reinforce. So rather than invent new things that say, oh, how do we take advantage of this new world we're in where we have digital natives and all this technology, we're not, there's almost none of that going on. We just see the Zooms coming on and they say, oh yeah, we have virtual breakout rooms. Yes. Zoom, breakout. Zoom, 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 Zoom. I mean, and a part of that is, you know, the teachers were never trained. They don't know how to use it. They don't have time. They, I mean, there's just so many. But Zoom is bad. It's what Zoom does and doesn't do. Sure. That's bad. So if Zoom, if, if we had just taken Zoom and said, all our classrooms from here on will have a kid, we'll have each kid from a different country, period. We will have no more local classrooms because this whole COVID thing has taken us out of the need to have local education. We can't have local sure. education. So, so, boy, that would have been really different. It would have been It'll interesting. Have, it would have been, yeah. But what we did was we just said, oh, well, we still want local education, of course. So we'll just take all our local kids and put them in the same Zoom room and thereby, thereby slowing down our Internet as we've experienced sure. earlier. So that's it's it's a failure of imagination. It's a huge failure of imagination. And it's maybe not the fault of the last pre-Internet generation because they didn't grow up in a in that time period where they could. But it definitely is the fault of, of, of humanity, in a sense, for not asking the right questions and for not saying, how do we do this differently? And, then, and the, the people who've done the most of it are the people that you're interested in, the sports people. Uh, they've gone the fastest, the furthest, the games people, actually. Yeah. You know, they said, okay, we can get our kids, you know, no, no more single person games. There are a few, but we let's get our kids playing together. Let's get them playing together in teams. Let's get all the things. Let's take a, a game. What my kid loves most about Grand Theft Auto is I can do anything. You know, yeah. it's just totally open ended simulation. If I want to be a cop, I can be a cop. If I want to be a robber. I can be a robber. I can steal a car or not steal a car. Whatever it is, I can do it. And that, you know, schools don't have that, that, idea that whatever it is i can do it that's not even in ed tech i mean i i, I talk to ed tech people all day long and they have no idea what 16 year old esports kids are doing how they stream what technology do they use to stream oh. what they don't understand any of the technology that's being yeah. used there so and, in the sense ed tech is gonna you know you got all these people there that are ed tech investors and they're going to, they tell you every day how many more billions are being spent on ed tech. And it's up to eight or nine or $10 billion. And it's all going to be wasted. It's all wasted. Anybody who invests in ed tech is crazy because they're <laughs> going to lose. And, you know, maybe not in the short term, but it definitely in the long term, because the future is what is being developed that is really engaging the kids, which is the games work. 
And so uh, how the, there's a huge trick or learning curve for figuring out to be done about applying that to things that we might consider as educationally important. And that's what I did for so many years. And I remember Will Wright, who was certainly one of the smartest people I ever met, uh, saying, you know, making a game is already really, really, really hard to make a game that really engages kids. Making a game with an agenda, with a content, with a curriculum, it's impossible. Don't even try. And, but of course, everybody's trying. And so, so uh, you know, I said, no, it's time to move on. Um, there you go. So, you have so you wrote write this article digital natives digital immigrants you've written you you write a book you know about digital games digital game based learning and then you go on to write a number of other books and at this time so you're working at this company that is now yours you're writing these books you've written an article that's very successful how do you find time to write so how do you find this motivation so you write this first book in 2001 you have your digital in immigrant digital native and you have a book come out how did you find like why did you decide to write this stuff like why write anything well um, that's really interesting speaking to what you're you're trying to investigate here because i had no idea for most of my life that I, writing was going to be important to me or that i could be a writer in fact the reason you have a PhD and I don't is I have three master's degrees is because I never thought I could write a hundred page thesis. Yeah. How can I write a hundred pages on something? It is, was not fun. <laughs> but by the time I got to write my first book, digital uh, game based learning, I knew so much about the field that I filled 450 pages yeah. and wrote a book that was far too long, far too big. So, so it turns out that uh, if you have something to say, if you have a point of view, if you have uh, information, but mostly a point of view, writing is not hard. In fact, I, uh, I was just reading something the other day that said, oh, you know, you're a writer with writer's block. I said, no, if you're not writing, you're not a writer. You're a wannabe writer. You know, and that's okay. You can be a wannabe writer. But a, a writer is somebody who constantly puts things down on paper and gets published. And it used to be in the past, you had to go through this whole huge process of figuring out if somebody wanted to publish your stuff. Now, you don't have to do that at all. You publish sure. it yourself. Sure. You just read it online. I publish mo all my articles on either Medium or Thrive Global. And I don't ever go to a publication. Nobody reads them. Yeah, no, I 100% I agree with that. I just, I published my first professional book this summer and I published it myself. Why? I, I can put it right on Amazon. Not only can you put it right on Amazon, but you can get this much, not much, but incredibly bigger percentage of anybody who buys it. Sure. And when you, when a, when a publisher publishes a book, you get a couple of bucks. When you publish your own book, you get, you know, 90% of the price. And you can set the price. It doesn't need to cost $200. Then you can set the price. So it, that, again, is part of this different world that we're in. And it's part of the, the, the um, first Internet generation world. And the real, a real stumbling block that we're having, and I'm seeing this and discussing it, writing it with all kinds of people, is that the people who were traditionally in charge of essentially mentoring and being role models for kids and showing them what to do, have no clue. They are just all scared to death. And they have no idea. All they know is, whoops, it's not going to be like it was in my time. You know, you grow up to be a lawyer. Well, no, 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 there aren't going to be any lawyers or whatever else it is. The, so they can mentor and be role models. And I was just proposing to a couple of people today that maybe it's time to reverse the role model model. To say it's time for kids to be the role models for adults and to say, here's how you go forward in a time of great uncertainty without being totally afraid. And here's how you figure out what you want to do um, when you, you know, have uncertain information. Uh, we put together this kind of thing. So 
one of the things that I've been wanting to do for a very long time, uh, I don't know if I will get to do it or I hope somebody else will, I'll leave the blueprints, is to create an app or a game or something that a kid can take every year, say, on their birthday or around their birthday. And what this thing will do is it will do what games do. It'll measure how they perform. It'll ask them bunches of questions like certain surveys do. It'll, it'll do a whole number of things that we found useful. And the output will be, well, here's a little information about who you are as an individual, as a unique individual, and here are some recommendations for things to look into. So for me, that didn't come till my 30s. For me, I took uh, an instrument called the Herman Brain Scan uh, sometime in my 30s, and it said, you know, I answered all the questions, and then it came back with the great fancy results, and it said, people with your uh, set of abilities, which were essentially very high analytical and very high creative, um, often do well in R&D. R&D, I'd never even heard the words before. You know, and, if, if, and suddenly I said, that's what I do. Yeah, when I was making games, it was R&D. When I was doing this, it was R&D. When I was, and if I had heard those terms, when I was 12 or even 20, it would have made a huge difference. So why do we deprive our kids of this? Why do we know the habits of highly successful people and not tell them, teach them to our kids? Why do we keep this stuff? It's really baffling to me that we do this kind of stuff. And so I'd love to help remedy that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. So basically, when you so you see so you have the you got the motivation to write these books you have a really interesting backstory here but you start you're not only writing books you're becoming a household name in those interested in gaming those interested in ed tech those interested in consulting like i'm hearing your name all over the place and i look at your resume and you're speaking everywhere is it from the digital natives article is that like how do you get invited to speak to 70 places in one year. It all grew from that. It, it, it grew from that because that, uh, and, and, and I'm working with a guy now who has this term of magic bullet, a silver bullet, I guess he says, that you know when you find the right words at the right time, um, just like we spoke earlier about gamification, um, it takes off. People, people are, become interested in it. And what happened with me is that I started there, but essentially I was interested in, in, in bringing up kids better. And, and I always thought that school was not a very good way to bring up kids for all those years. So I started saying, well, what's bad about school? And I wrote, after I wrote a book about games, I wrote a book about, about engagement, which is what games led me to. I had the hypothesis that, that, um, Games have all the engagement and no content, and school has all the content and no engagement. So that putting them together would be the the uh, savior of the world. And it turned out that wasn't true, mostly because good educational games are very, very hard to create. And sure. They come up in occasional and serendipity. You can't create a world of Warcraft and 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 in and with the focus being on ed tech, it's so difficult. I mean you think about the money, world the budget goes there. It's it's a couple of things. One, it's so difficult. So, you know, car and it, it, it's limited. Carmen San Diego did it at first, right? They kids a lot of kids. I still know a lot of facts about the world because of Carmen sure. San Diego. But it's limited. Mm -hmm. And the, and the worst part was when I got into the business is that the technology keeps changing. So you've got to, you know, you create it, even if you create a really nice product, you've got to keep updating it yeah. and updating it and updating it. And that's what software companies do, but that's expensive yes. and you need a source of revenue and you need uh, all this kind of stuff. So, so it's, it's not a good avenue to go. The game. But then I discovered the problem is not really on engagement. Because why aren't the kids engaged? You know, and then I said, well, maybe it's the content. And I wrote a book about content. And then I said, maybe it's the pedagogy. And I wrote a book about pedagogy. And and finally, I said, no, it's the way to, it's the way we treat our kids. And I wrote a book about 
the way we treat our kids and that we're a whole lot better having higher expectations and having them do projects and thinking that they can accomplish things and, and having them go in those directions than we are with what we used to do in the old days. And now I'm writing a book. Now I say it even goes beyond that. It goes beyond our beliefs. It goes to our beliefs. And that's the next book is going to be um, about that. And it's going to hopefully, I, I don't know, but my theme these days is empowering the humans of the future. So I'm really talking about how the, not just the technology, but the combination of technology and beliefs empowers kids and it will empower all the people in the future. They will believe they are powerful. They will have the tools to be powerful and they will have a focus on what their power should be used for. And then hopefully that will make a better world. So That's this is, true. so this is what's next for you. You're, you're at the global future education foundation right now. You're one of the founders and you're writing this new book. Is that, is that your, is that your future plan for the time being? Do you ever see yourself retiring and just saying, you know what, I'm going to live on an Island. Oh, absolutely not. Why, why I love everything I do. I wake up in the morning early and I start working and I have more ideas in my head for things and articles to write and chapters to write than I could possibly write down. Uh, so I keep trying to do that. And I keep saying, you know, I really should put out every day another, um, you know, message on LinkedIn and I should put, write another article and I try. Yeah. Uh, the next big thing will be to collect a lot of these things into my next book. Um, but if I have an idea, so my last book was a very simple book. It was called Beliefs for 21st Century Kids. And it's no more than 30 pages of very small text on a page. But it's if you believe these things, kids, you'll have a different life than if you believe what your parents thought. Um, so, and it's free and it's an ebook. And I discovered a tool where you could just publish a free ebook. And so I did. That's uh, awesome. And it's, it's really, it's exciting because, you know, I, I, I like speaking. I like the virtual speaking. I'm trying to get better at that. Uh, it's very, you know, each time you say, well, do I need slides? Do I need this? Sure, sure. Oh, what can I do? How can I have a studio? Um, I'm working with people around that. Uh, and that's, that's fun and interesting. And how you reach the people. But basically, I have a message that not everybody has, that in fact, almost nobody has. And this message is about empowering kids and empowered kids. And so what my life is, is searching for the other people who share that perspective. And I find them, and there are a number of us around the world, and trying to work together with them. And then putting that into words or videos or, or any way that it will get to people who want to join and who think this way. So that's, that's really, uh, every day I try to think of new ways to do that. Uh, we just had a wonderful idea. I, I was telling in some of my talks, I was telling people like in India or other places that they should rename their ministry of education to the ministry of empowerment and accomplishment. And of course, nobody is going to do that, <laughs> at least in the short term. So we're going to start the ministry of empowerment and accomplishment. We're just going to start the ministry. And if you want to, you know, be part of it or add it to your country or do whatever you want, we'll sort of have it, in, you know, more or less in place for you. Um, and that's the, that's the world we live in. That's what's so exciting for me, is that I can meet these people from all over the world, like you, people who call me up out of the blue and say, hey, I'd like to talk. And then we can talk and we can, you know, enjoy each other's company. Uh, without having traveled or doing done any sure. of those things to get there, uh, we can do it again and again if we liked it. And that world, to me, is so much better than the world we had before. I mean, I like in person. I have I have my wife and my kid to hug, but other than you know family hugs and 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 reproduction. 
we don't really need to touch other people. This is, I'm looking you in the eye. That's yeah, just it's, it's, good. it's good enough for me. I mean, I'm that person. I, I, I prefer this digital. Yeah, I've got three kids downstairs and my wife and three kids. That's way, way more than enough. That's plenty touching. That's right. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's enough. <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, the, uh, yeah, there's some feeling of every, you know, 80,000 people in a sports stadium or whatever. But but that may just be a thing of the past. Yeah. Just like clipper ships are a thing of the past. They were very nice. They look beautiful. But uh, the, we don't have them anymore. We yeah. Don't. And we really don't need them because we have better things. And that's really where I see the world headed. Um, and, and it's not that we won't have people. Of course we will. But they will be hybrids with technology. Yeah. It's not either or. Somebody... Uh, you know Andreas Schleicher, the OECD guy? Oh, yeah. You know, I just heard him speak the other day, and he was saying, oh, there's this big race between humans and technology, and one going up and then the other going up. But no, it's a race between humans with technology and nature. And guess what? It's a hard race because nature always wins. <laughs> and so, but no, it, if you frame things the wrong way, in a way that is from the past, this is my really biggest point that I want to leave with. If you frame things in the way we framed them in the 20th century, in the way that the digital immigrants framed them or the last pre-internet generation framed them, you will not get very far in this very different world that our kids are going to live in. And so I try to reframe. All right. Well, Mark, we're about at time. I, if you have time for one more question, I've got one more sure. question. Yeah. All right. The, so here's where I have to go. <laughs> if you if you could tell me the the pivotal points or the pivotal influences that you had on your career, looking back, what what would they be? My career worked like this. I would do something that I wanted to do. And, and I really tried hard to do something I want to do. And when I was in business school, a recruiter looked at my resume and said, wow, you must be really rich. I said, what? I come from the projects. And why do you think I'm rich? She said, because you just did whatever you wanted to. And so that, to me, was really the goal. And still is. You do what you want to do, what you think is best. The transitions and there have been many, were always very hard. They were always crises. They were always, you get to some place in some field or something, or you're at a you know, Boston Consulting Group, or you're at a bank, or you're at this, or you're the head of a company, and then you change. And when you change, you start over. You really, you know, my whole, there are people who just think that I'm still in games. And that, um, and that's great that they like those books and that they like what I said about that stuff. But boy, is that a mistake? You know, they they write to me at my old games to train address, which doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> so an issue with that. Um, I like change. I like progression. I like to think about new things to do and new challenges. I, for me. The optimal, the optimal number of times for doing something is two. The first time you do it, you learn a lot. Second time you do it, you do it a lot better. And then it's time to do something else. Or it's taking a new channel if you do it more in, in a more complex or a different way. That's who I am. And I, uh, not everybody is like that. My son is different from me in lots of ways. Um, I'm more curious universally than he is that's than than some people are i'll you know put me on quora and i'll be happy to look at whatever anybody's talking about and learn something about that i browse youtube every night um just to learn new things and and not everybody's like that but what i'm good at it turns out in the end is putting all those things together in my head and coming out with a new concept or distinction or or framework or categorization, um, you know, like, like the old academics versus empowerment and accomplishment. Uh, and, and, and people say to me, and I've gotten emails this way, I like the way you frame things. And that's just something that I happen to be good at. 
Um, I guess that's the only reason I got into BCG after, you know, the, having been a musician. Because uh, after they did the 20 interviews that they put me through, they said, yeah, maybe he has some perspectives. And, and I enjoy that. And I enjoy when anybody tells me almost anything, I try to say, well, is there another way to see that too? You know, you tell me this is bad, but maybe there's a way to see it as good, like the kids with their phones. Uh, you tell me this is good, but maybe there's a way to see it as bad, like the old tech stuff. Um, so that's really me. I, I just keep looking at things and trying to frame them in interesting ways and see if I can add value to, to anybody because of that. And if people don't want it right away, I just leave a roadmap. I just write the books. I just write it down. And hopefully, like... Leonardo da Vinci, and not that I'm him, but he wrote down his, you know, nobody listened, nobody cared. He just wrote it all down backwards, of course. And, and eventually, 400 years later, people started caring. Yes. And I think that's the same with Bach, who was very unappreciated right after he lived. So and, many, so and many. Yard. And what that means is that they're thinking into the future. Mm -hmm. and, and, they, and eventually, the future catches up. Uh, not with everybody, not in every state, but if they, if the thoughts and the creations are are valuable, then it will. And so, you know, digital natives caught up with me. The world caught up. That was nobody cared at first. Uh, and other things that's happened to, and other things happened. I, you know, I tried to float terms like digital wisdom or 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 uh, um, uh, futurification. You know, or, or things like that, and they didn't. Nobody picked. Nobody wanted them. Um, so it's it partially a matter of chance, which is what everything. Is. Sure. Um, but that's uh, if you want to know how I got to where I got to. That's I think more or less how it happened. It was a a painful process of lots of transitions. Well, that's awesome. That's great. Good story, Mark. That's uh, it's it's awesome. It's you said a lot. You said a lot of cool stuff. Um, I want to thank you very much. It was a great conversation. Well, I hope uh, you do something nice with it, and please uh, send it my way. Oh, definitely. And, and uh, I'm very pleased to know you, and I'm glad to know you're working on this interesting project. And if I can help you in any way, and if I can put you in touch with those other people we talked about or whatever I can do, I'm happy to do that. Thank you.